<laughs> You're listening to the Barn Church Podcast. Have Pastor Phil and Lori Gargano in the studio today to talk about part three of our new series. Awe and wonder is what we are discussing today. Listen, Jesus lived an ascended lifestyle. Everything he did revolved around the kingdom of heaven. He walked it. He talked it. He did things. There was so much to Jesus, and it's because he embodied what it is like to fear the Lord, to have this awesome wonder and respect. You can too. Listen in. Stay tuned because the TBC Sermon Podcast starts right now. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us for yet another Barn Church Podcast. I am your host. I'm sitting here in the studio today with two wonderful people. We have one that uh, sits on our five-fold council, another one that sits on our board of directors, and they are a power couple. They also lead and help direct our training center and ministry school. So without any further ado, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves, sir? I'm Phil Gargano. I hold a pastoral seat. And I'm Lori Gargano for his lovely wife <laughs> and very, very lovely wife and Lori <laughs> definitely operates in the apostolic gifting oh um, yeah <laughs> very much a mother of what how many how many children do you have 12 12 children that is a lot of kiddos uh they um have a farm located in uh s- slightly north of Benton Harbor and it is beautiful they have dogs they have cats they have cows they have chickens they have goats, sheep, ducks, pigs. It is a. It's actually a zoo. I'm sorry. It's um. That should be. You should be charging admission. <laughs> Don't enter the gate without pay. <laughs> <laughs> Old McDonald had nothing over on us. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful little spot. It's a. It was. Um, you can always tell when you're in the midst of a lot of animals, and if you're not used to what animals bring to the <laughs> to the forefront it's like you get out of the van like so we were dropping off our daughter to hang out with one of your daughters and we walk out and i'm just like oh my goodness wafting of poo <laughs> <laughs> i'm like we're on a farm uh, we're on a farm remember that jared you're not too far removed from farmland out in all clear <laughs> but i don't usually get uh, the waft from it we had just cleaned out an area and had moved it all over as compost into an area that's going to be a big flower garden. So that's probably why it was, it was a about, little more extreme About 30 yesterday. foot away from where you parked, right. so I'm sure it was waffling over there. <laughs> well, it certainly did. <laughs> I thought I stepped in something uh, when I first got I'm like, what in the world? Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> No, ex- but, no excrement stories, right? Yeah, no, well, I mean, if it comes up, if, if <laughs> doth the spirit strike. Um, but we are on part three of our Awe and Wonder series. Now, the Lord had given us some directives over the past few months, you know, in the past year, of things he wanted us to discuss, things he wanted us to talk about to the body for encouragement, for teaching, for direction, for instruction. And this particular series, Awe and Wonder, I'm sure you could probably extrapolate from those two words exactly what it is that we're discussing here today and have been for the past couple of weeks. This is your first venture into this podcast, and this is the very first one that you listen to. I would implore you to go back two more and listen to the previous. So, We're talking about a very hot topic, at least in my perspective, because the church hasn't done a great job of talking about this subject matter with any type of veracity. I think it needs to be discussed a lot more. I think it needs to be talked about and taught on a lot more, and that is the fear of the Lord. So, Phil, without any further ado, what was the Lord stirring up inside of you? during your preparation for this message? Well, um, 
First of all, I found the scripture in Psalms that talked about what the fear of the Lord is. As far as I was concerned, that was a definition of what the fear of the Lord is supposed to be. And in that definition, it basically is saying that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, hate arrogance, hate pride, hate a pervasive or a, a perverse tongue, and hate the evil way. And as Christians, this is just something that should be a normal act on our part every day, hating those things. Um, but uh, beyond that, uh, I also felt like the Lord was saying, yeah, that's part of it, but I want you to focus not so much on what uh, what uh, fear of the Lord is as much as uh, let's talk about the ascending lifestyle. And that's kind of where I went with that, so— Okay, well, let's let's get into the ascended lifestyle. I know you mentioned a quote from uh, Bill Johnson on this, and I'm going to quote this as best as I can. Uh, ascended living is living in a place of fellowship with him. He actually designed it where I could live in the felt realization of his presence. I could host his word in my soul as the greatest of treasures, and at the end results would be that I could speak and things would happen. And you later went on to clarify that during Jesus's time on earth, he lived an ascended lifestyle. So let's get into that. Exactly what is typifying of a or an ascended lifestyle? Well, look at his example. Um, uh, we talked about uh, how he was resurrected and then ascended and then was glorified in heaven. But that was after his ministry on earth. We were referring to his ministry here on earth. Um, Jesus basically lived an ascended lifestyle every day. Um, often in the in the scriptures and in the gospels, we we read where he went off on his own to pray and to be with the Father. What he was doing was he was relating to the Father, and that was an ascended lifestyle, being able to relate to the Father. But more importantly. Well, it was, I don't think it, for him it wasn't a matter of awareness. It was just a part of his life to seek the Father and to do what he told him to do. Because it says in John that I only do what the Father tells me to do. So, and and he was given the Spirit um, without measure. Um, so that enabled him to, even though he was in a physical body and he was stuck on earth, it allowed him to ascend to a heavenly place almost every day with his father, consistently, constantly relating to him. Um, so as it goes for our lifestyle, we weren't given the Spirit with, without measure. We were given a part of the Spirit. Of course, when we got saved, we were infilled with the Spirit of God. Right. So that allows us um, access uh, to areas that we probably don't even understand how deep our relationship with God can be. Um, and so when we talk about an ascended lifestyle for us as Christians, um, it is nothing more than becoming aware of the presence of God that is always with us. God, the Spirit is in our heart. It, he's, and it's, it's, He's with us at all times, but because of the distractions of life, um, you know, a lot of times um, we just don't even are aware of that we have access all the time and that he's with us all the time. And the more we understand that, the more we become to that place with him, um, that's where our lives begin to change. And things begin, circumstances are changed, obstacles are removed. Um, God increases our faith. Um, then we begin to collaborate with the Father. In other words, we begin to work with him about his plan that he has for this earth and for us. And, um, well, that's basically a centered life. That's that's basically what it is, just being aware that Jesus is present at all times. And Bill Johnson makes makes that statement. He calls it the felt realization. And 
that is something that we as, as Christians, a lot of times we don't take into consideration our emotions a lot. But a lot of times it says, well, it says in the Bible, Jesus said that we as Christians are like the wind. And the wind you can feel. You can't see it, but you can feel it. So he brings into the uh, into light the idea that emotions are good. It is, they're not all bad. And to be able to feel his presence and, and, and realize that that's what you're feeling um, just puts you in a different dimension with the Lord. I would agree with you. And one thing that I realize, I, I, I don't know if this is, you know, really talked about very often in a lot of uh, church circles, but really when it comes down to it, uh, we're trying to merge the physical and the spiritual in a way that brings about a completely new level of living. Okay. So, you know, for me, you know, I can get the tinglys all over when the spirit of the Lord comes in. Uh, that's pretty palpable because there's things going around, but there is also that same effect psychologically that can happen when you listen to good music and the presence of God's not there. So what we've kind of compartmentalized the church or the spiritual aspects of living and whatever our physical reality is at that moment. So we can be very momentary beings. So what I have learned through the course is there are times where, you know, we all have those gut checks where something just doesn't feel right and we can't really put our fingers on it, but it's the Lord peaking our emotions or even a physical thing in our spirit that we can actually feel and it kind of just gets into our physical body and we tend to more often than not second guess that physicality or that physical response or that emotional response because we are wanting we're wanting this transcendent aspect when the lord's saying no i need you to live move and have my being in the mm-hmm. moment mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. so as a mom lori yeah you have a intuition correct yes all right so how about you weigh in on this? How would how would you, as a mother, try to help other mothers explain exactly what your husband is talking about? Um, I think God definitely gives moms and parents um, a spidey sense is what I call it. Spidey, yeah. <laughs> so when you, or and discernment. So when you have a check in your spirit, that something isn't right with your kiddos or what they're saying doesn't line up or what, you know, ask questions. <laughs> I always say you don't, you got to ask questions because then it'll lead you to the truth and you can guide them to the truth. Sometimes they don't even know truth within themselves. And because they're not always in tune because they're, they're growing. So you ask questions. You guide them to the truth and or find the truth together. And then together you can say, okay, so how can we do this better? Or how can we adjust this? Or how does this, um, how was this look in Jesus' eyes? You, you know, you, ha- you have to ask the questions. You have to bring, throw the balls back and forth in the courts. Yes. Agreed. So as a father, obviously Phil, you're one as well. Um, <laughs> there's that common saying that fathers know best, right? We just have a, sometimes our default position may not always be the correct one in the moment, but it pans out most often to be uh, one filled with wisdom. Um, I can I can tell you as a father of three children, and obviously my dad had two, um, there were many things that I did not agree with him on in the moment at all, but because he was my father and I enjoyed not um, being in trouble, so to speak, (laughs) 
<laughs> or getting spanked or grounded or anything like that. Uh, I acquiesced and listened, and then it, I, I would find out, well, that was probably the smart thing to do. How would you equate that experience uh, of those types of situations uh, with how the Father deals with us? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, Paul says in Romans, I think chapter 10, I can't remember the exact verse, but it uh, says the kingdom of God is not uh, food or drink, mm-hmm. but is righteousness, peace, and joy. And I believe that as a father, we need to be walking that out daily. Um, now, our children will look, at, look to us as examples. And so if we can be the kind of an example, let's talk about like chaos, for instance, because being a father, being, living, having, you know, as many children as we have, sometimes it can be chaos. Sometimes. <laughs> and a farm. Come on. And a farm. But, you know, but let's just focus on the children themselves. Um, it, it can, you know, they're always, they're always fighting. There's always someone that's mad at someone. And so it seems like an everyday event where, um, I'll be in a quiet room watching TV or reading or my Bible or watching Christian videos or whatever, and the door will s- they'll charge open through the door, and, and Joshua, my youngest, is screaming and hollering, John's going to kill me, John's going to kill me. That's my son, John. He's a... Uh, 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 I don't. He's he's almost seventeen, eighteen, and um, so you know the first the first way that we uh, I probably would say the way I used to react to is get all upset and start screaming back, <laughs> but a lot of times now what I'm doing and I believe this is a part of understanding what the ascended lifestyle is like is a lot of times I can be just kind of peaceful about it, and I can say okay, so why is John trying to you know spray you with water? Did you spray water with him? Did you spray water on him? Of course, I'm going to get his explanation, and then I'm going to get John's explanation. But having a calm, calming spirit kind of brings down the chaos. And so as a father, um, that's what our job is supposed to do. That's what our job is supposed to be like. Um, Righteousness, peace, and joy. So once you can calm them down, then you can see a little peace in the quiet comes back, and, you know, they basically walk away, still probably mad at each other, but they're not, you know, at least putting hands on each other. So um, I, I think that's, you know, that's kind of like what it is with God, with us. A lot of times, you know, he's, and, and uh, of course, as we begin to perfect this um, type of lifestyle, um, we become more Christ-like. We begin to think like God, we begin to act like God, and it's a little bit easier for him to get through to us because our attitude is 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 uh, open to him. But a lot of times, there are times when God will ask us to do things that we don't really want to do. And, I'll, you know, having living in this kind of ascended lifestyle brings it back to, but I want to do what God wants me to do. So I'm just going to lay my flesh down, and I'm just going to follow him and, and do what he he expects me to do. And as parents, um, if we can do that with God, then our children will do it with us. And ultimately, this all comes down to having an awe and wonder oh, for oh, the Lord. Exactly. I mean, that's we, the part we miss so much yeah. about this series. I think I've kind of missed it. I hope I pointed it out in the sermon that I did. But what awe and wonder is there in having a relationship with God? I mean, that's just, it's an awe and wonder every day, you yeah. know? I mean, his love for us is so powerful and so strong. And how would you not want to do what he wants you to do because of the love that you have for him, because of the love that he has for us? That's the awe and the wonder. That is the awe and wonder. Amen. Yep. And from where I'm sitting— from the last three, from yours to Michael's to Kara's, we've we've traveled this journey where we've had various different perspectives, and it's been beautiful, but oh. they've been pretty seamless. To get to yours, and you're talking about living in a way that not only glorifies the Father, but the root of it was and is 
that awe, that wonder, that immense weight of who God is and why we should want to make sure that our lifestyle, our decisions, our words, our actions line up with the way we believe. And I think that's the biggest problem with our our culture today, our continued um, issues with the world, whatever the case may be, wherever that is, the culture itself is so loosey-goosey, lackadaisical. There's very little intentionality anymore. It's flying by the seat of your pants, uh, which really hasn't changed in 2,000 years. There's still a lot of people that do that. But uh, doing the right thing doesn't mean you're doing it for the right reasons. And so I think our culture is just more or less just virtue signaling a lot of things like, hey, look at me over here. I'm doing the right thing. But it's really not based in what it should be. So what you're saying is you're flipping the script on the culture and saying you should be doing things for the right reasons. That's going to birth the right thing. And and changing it all and going, hey, get back to the right thing. And the right thing is get back to the Word, get back to the Lord, get back to what God's design is for your life. That's where the wellspring of life comes from. That's where the living water flows from. And But you can only get there if you have a love of the Father that transcends the love of your flesh. That's right. And so that's what I'm hearing in this discussion, and that's kind of how you put it. You asked some questions, um, I believe, or you've posed some things in your sermon, and you you said this, at least I believe you did. Will you live every day like you live in heaven? That's a conscious choice. Mm -hmm. And there are people that don't want to make that choice because they really like the stuff down here. Uh, It's not that we're advocating for people to be so heavenly minded. They're no earthly good. But if you come from a position of heaven mindedness, you have a tendency to be a lot less like the world in your interactions with the world. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Still being able to uh, transform your culture or transform your sphere of influence for the sake of the gospel and for Jesus. Um, and then you also said something else. Uh, it was a question. Will you let Jesus mature you and love you? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, well, you know, that com- that question kind of, uh, is kind of part of uh, the scripture in John where uh, Jesus says, we have much to say. We have much. I'm basically tra- uh, paraphrasing now. We have much to say. We have much to um, to talk about. We've witnessed much. <clears throat> But yet, you don't want to see it. You don't want to listen. That was an indictment on our walk with God. Um, how many times does God want to enter to enter into a conversation or a relationship or a plan that he may have for our lives? But because of all the distractions that play around us every single day, um, we're not listening to him. How much does that hurt his heart when he wants to give us and 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 give to us uh, the secrets and the mysteries of heaven? But yet we don't want to listen to it. You know, when my kids don't listen to me, um, it kind of hurts. You know, when especially when I giving my older children some advice or whatnot, and they just kind of blow me off. Well, you know. Um, that's their choice. That's their right to blow me off. But at the same time, it does kind of ding you a little bit. Yeah. And so I think about almost every day, God is wanting us to collaborate with him in some way, but yet we're not listening to him. And that just has got, just got to break his heart. So that opened up my eyes to, wow, father, I just want to be presence driven. I want to make sure that when I get up in the morning, I'm understanding and being aware that you're right here with me, that you're going to be with me the rest of the day. Now, my wife will tell you, I'm not that good at it yet. Um, There are times when, you know, uh, I'm not very Christ-like to her. 
Um, so I'm working. It's a work in progress, right? And so this is a, a relatively new concept to me. <laughs> I've been a Christian for a long time, but this is new. It should have been a new concept when I first got saved. But it is I, now. I'm starting to pick up the mantle. I'm starting to understand it, and so that's the way I choose to live. But I'm not that great at it yet. So I got to be patient, and I guess got to let God do His work, and He'll bring me to that place eventually. Where I'll be able, as Johnson says, I'll have a felt realization about the kingdom of God every single day, and that's the goal. So, and that, and and I think what you're also imploring everybody else is is you're just bringing the humanist uh, to the human side of it. Yeah, yeah, your mm-hmm. human yeah. side, and say, hey, you know, I've been recently walking this journey. I'm not perfect at it. Uh, if there's anyone in the room that would know it better than myself, it would be the woman sitting next to you, right? But she's f- she's obviously understanding that you're walking this journey and it's influencing her. But I think the thing is, is there was a there's a term I want to, or a terminology, the pain of diminished influence, and I think it goes both for the physical as well as the spiritual. So when we want our children who are older to listen to us, even though that pain may not be like a physical pain, it's more like "Ah, this. But when you add the spiritual context of it, the very real implications of the diminished influence is when we push the Lord out of our sphere of influence, because we have that power. We have that ability. Yes. Free will. Um, it, exactly. It's the free will aspect of it. If he really wants to get a hold of us, he will. Yes. I mean, very well. I mean, there is nothing he won't do, and there's right. nothing he can't do. Um, so him being the purveyor of all things, we decide based on our choices, based on our experiences, based on whatever, available information at that time, whatever have you. We push him outside, and the pain of diminished influence in our lives is the result of sin, and that's when sin can overtake you. Exactly what you're saying, Phil, the more we invite him in to our every moment, every waking moment, every day situation, even the mundane, I mean, you could have the felt realization of the presence of God while you're cleaning a stall. Exactly. Exactly. And right. that's where it should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lori, you can have the felt realization of the presence of God picking basil out of your garden. <laughs> and we should, because that's the awe and wonder, right? I mean, he... It's living in the fear of the Lord. He And it's living in his creation of what yeah. he gave us. None of this appeared <laughs> for nothing. It was given to us through him. So every thing that we get to experience in life is because of his love for us. And that should bring us to the awe and the wonder every day. I agree. And one of the main points of the awe and wonder is this. Um, you know, Adam screwed up, turned the keys of this world over to the enemy. So now the enemy owns this world. Um, God owns it, but the enemy's in charge because... Adam gave it to him. Um, So God can't just charge into our world and, you know, stop all these horrific things that need to be stopped because he cannot control us. We all have free will. But what God wants us to do, and he has to do it this way because it's, it's the only way we can do it right now, until the world comes to the end, the second coming, whatever, is for, he needs to ha- he needs to use us. He has to work through us to accomplish his goals. And when I say collaborate with the Holy Spirit, collaborate with God, that's what I mean. He wants us to partner with him to do his work and to do his bidding. But we have to understand his heart. And if we don't understand his heart, we're not going to be able to do what he wants us to do. And that's all part of the ascended lifestyle, is learning to understand what God's heart is for whatever area of life that we're dealing with. And as we collaborate with him, we begin to make change. We can begin to change life around us. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to change life around us. So 
It's beautiful. It, it, it's a great, <laughs> and the, the beautiful thing about it is he gives us everything we need. He gives us the grace, the faith, the understanding. It all comes from him. All we have to do is listen and be obedient. You know, I'm taken back to Job, who, for the most part, as it states in that book from the first to the 42nd chapter, he was a perfect man. I mean, that's what it basically said. Now, that's not meaning that he was perfect in everything that he did. At that moment, he was perfect. And then the enemy went, petitioned. God said, have you considered my servant Job? And he's like, I can't touch him because you've protected him. I can't touch him. <laughs> you, I can't do anything to him. So why don't you do this? I bet you he will curse you and he will die. So obviously, you know, we see that that does not happen. Uh, and then he is restored to all things. And what do we learn from the life of Job? There's a whole lot of moaning and groaning in, in, the, in those chapters right. within the first and the 42nd chapter. And there is very lit, little bit about his redemption or even how he really lived. Um, we just hear this whole diatribe from his friends rebuking him because they were saying, you're not as holy as you think you are, yada, yada, this, yada, yada, that. Obviously, the Lord said, you're going to have to repent because you spoke things that were incorrect of me. So what do we know from that? How could we take the life of Job and put it to where we're talking about right now? Well, first and foremost, he feared the Lord. Mm -hmm. He he worshipped, mm -hmm. he taught his family to worship, and when things went wrong, people automatically assumed that that's because he was living incorrectly. It, folks, it doesn't matter if you're living correctly or incorrectly. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. That means the Lord is the Lord of everything, and everything is done for a reason. And whether somebody sins and somebody doesn't sin, the same good things can happen to both or the same bad things can happen to both. It does not matter. How you walk through those situations actually matters more right. than the situations that happen to you. And I think that's the lesson that we need to take from Job and a lot of the other things. Jesus had a very specific purpose, a very specific ministry, and he walked it out to completion, getting up on a cross, sacrificing himself, being the payment for all of our sins was no easy task. And training 12 different men was also no easy task. And so what, what do we learn from the life of Jesus? He was a surrendered vessel. Yes. He wanted to do what the Father wanted him to do. He, wanted, he prayed what he prayed. He said what he said. That is how we also need to live, a surrendered but ascended lifestyle. So, Phil, thank you so much for the beautiful a message this past weekend. It is a definitely a reminder on how we should be focused in our day-to-day -day life, how we should be more focused on the things of God and less focused on our responses to the flesh. If we can get outside of ourselves, we're are we going to be perfect at it? Absolutely not. But thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace and the journey that we're all on because he started the work Jesus is going to finish it. Amen. So uh, you the one who can finish it is Jesus. Right? <laughs> and he, not only did he finish the work, he is finishing us within that work, and it's beautiful. So you did have a third point. Uh, do you even remember what it was? You never got to it in your in your. <laughs> I wanted to see if you wanted to bring it out right now. We got a few more minutes left. I'm trying to rack my brain, but I can't remember what my third point was. It's in my notes, but I don't have my notes here, so that's okay. Um, but folks, you got the meat and potatoes of what. Phil talked about on Sunday, but a little bit of exposition, which is what we like to do here on these podcasts. If you really want to uh, listen to his particular sermon, go to our YouTube channel at The Barn Ministries and look for the most recent service, which would be, uh, geez, I'm totally blanking. The 16th yeah, is the 16th. most recent yeah, one. 16th, yeah. And yeah. also join us this coming Sunday at 1030 here in St. Joe, Michigan, if you are looking for a fellowship where not only we're teaching scripture, 
It is the gospel the way the Lord wants it taught to train and perfect the saints. We are a fivefold ministry. We are not afraid of calling ourselves a fivefold ministry because we definitely believe that that is the way the church was supposed to operate. So come and join us. We also have some Friday Night Light uh, happenings here. We have uh, our next one is going to be on the 28th of July. Come and join us back here in the prayer room at 7 p.m. And we also have regular prayer throughout the week. Our staff prayer starts at 8 and goes till 9 a.m. But the prayer room is available for anyone all day Every day that the office is open, and with that being said, hold we, on, oh, hold oh, on. I oh, remember, oh. I remember what it was. Listen, he has much to say. The third point. Third point was listen. He has much to say. Yes, that's that was, was worth the interruption. <laughs> Sorry, I like that. <laughs> no, that's okay. That was worth it. So listen, he has much to say. That's that says it all right there. Take that last point. You heard it here first. We didn't even get that little wisdom nugget on Sunday. <laughs> Listen, he has a lot to say. And I think with that, we will end this podcast and we will wrap it up. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Bye. God is moving and desires to move in your life too. We know listening to this podcast is one of the many ways he can work in your life. The Barn Church and Ministries exists to create environments where people encounter Christ and are empowered to advance the kingdom. Check us out on the web at thebarn.church or follow us on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at The Barn Ministries. Listen to this podcast on Amazon, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Spreaker podcast platforms. A new podcast is posted every Friday. If you would like to reach us, send us an email to podcast at thebarn.church or visit us in person at The Barn Church in St. Joseph, Michigan. Service times are Sundays at 1030 a.m. 